Borno leaders agree to forgive and accept 3,000 repentant terrorists. And Edo State lawmakers uh, elect still not inaugurated after two years. This is Plus Politics, and I am Usao Gye Ogbonwa. Community leaders in Borno State have agreed to the return of repentant Boko Haram terrorists into their communities. Also, senators representing Borno State in the National Assembly have proposed the construction of a settlement for all repentant Boko Haram terrorists. Joining us to discuss this is uh, Security Specialist Kabir Adamu and Legal Practitioner Maxwell Akbara. Thanks for joining us, exactly. uh, Ms. Akbara. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much. Great to have, have you on the program. And just before Kabir Adamu joins us, let's start with uh, talking about, um, you know, the, the idea of repentant terrorists. And we've heard this a few times in, in the last few years. But at the same time, we still, we still hear of attacks. Not long ago, we heard of the attack on the uh, Nigerian Defense Academy. This morning, we spoke about uh, Senator Bala uh, Ibn Naaba, uh, Naala, I beg your pardon. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. This one is breaking. You are, you are not too audible. They are not, they are not audible. All right. Um, can you hear me in any way clearer now? Yes. Okay. I, uh, so, so let me see. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. The, the thing is like... It's uh, continue, continue. Let me try. All right. I, I just wanted you to start with, you know, talking about the fact that there are reports of repentant terrorists, but at the same time, we're still having attacks in certain parts of the country. Uh, what does that, you know, say to you? Okay. Um, if you can hear me, uh, you are talking about uh, the repentance, the purported repentance, uh, Boko Haram and bandits and the uh, uh, consequent and the subsequent attack on uh, military formations and uh, their distance. So you are trying to place it side by side, yes. whether, 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 they are, whether they will still have truly repentant banditry and Boko Haram. Well, yes. Go, let's hear your thoughts on that. Now, now, in the first instance, I want to say this thing uh, with due respect that uh, they are politicizing everything. They are playing with uh, the lives of uh, Nigeria. Because one, when somebody said that he has repented, just like in our day-to-day -day activities, if your own son or your, your own child committed a crime in the house and he said, Daddy, Daddy forgive me, I have repented, I, I, I won't do it again, you will say, yes, I have forgiven you. But you will still watch that your child, whether, whether he, 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 he or she has truly repented. What do I mean? If the person committed a crime in the morning and the pleaded with you, said, Daddy, please, oh, forgive me, oh, I have repented. And they, you are still trying to see if he has actually repented. He committed the same crime again in that afternoon. And we are still talking about that. He committed the same crime again in this evening. Then where is the repentance there? If you should ask me, that I don't say politics with the whole thing. I did not say any, any atom of repentance. And when somebody said that he has repented, and uh, someone who committed this kind of genocide, who has killed, who has done a lot of things, who has been in the bush for years, for months, and the person has tell you that I have repented. One, as a responsible government, you don't, uh, you don't accept it in hook, line, and sinker. You first of all, as a person, I have accepted. Yes, you have repented. I have accepted that you have repented. But let me just watch you. I don't know whether you are, you are, you are, you are hearing what I'm saying. Yes, um, I am, Mr. Akbaram. Yeah. So, but but yeah. kindly hold on. Now, um, now, 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 you you watch the person. If the 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 purported Boko Haram people say that they have repented, you first of all you receive them. When you receive them, you will now confine them in a place that they will be rehabilitated. I'm talking about the correctional center. Then when you kept them that place, that's where they will be. They will be rehabilitated, and 
Their rehabilitation is something, it's not something that will take for one day, it's not a one week something, it's not one month something, it's not even one year something. You, when you rehabilitate them, then you now get them and watch them. I don't know whether you're getting what I'm saying. Somebody who has been living in the bush, uh, committing crime for years, who just woke up, he said that he has repented under three days. You ask him on that one week, you ask him that yes, I have seen, you have repented, you have let them listen. You recruit him back to the military. You recruit him back, you release them back to the society. Are we not joking? All right, ho hold on. Hold on, Mr. Alpara. Kindly yeah. hold on. Um, I want to bring in a security um, uh, specialist, uh, uh, Kabir Adamu. Uh, Mr. Adamu, can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Good evening. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. Uh, great to see you again. Um, so now one of the challenges that I feel like we, you know, Nigeria has, um, or the media even has with this, is being able to distinguish between bandits, ISWAP, Boko Haram, or known gone men, um, and know who's repenting and who's not repenting. So we can know if you know, there's a part that is repenting and then there's still those who are attacking the Nigerian Defense Academy. Um, but besides that, is it possible or should we instead be rehabilitating these people while being incarcerated? So, um, yes, and, you know, I agree with you totally that um, this is one of the challenges, not just with the media, but um, even with some policy makers, unfortunately, the inability to disaggregate the various uh, players within the security um, subsector. Uh, it's very important that we disaggregate them. And then once we disaggregate them, of course, we will know what is driving them. We'd also know what to do to address um, the challenges. Now, the repentant ones that we have seen in the last few weeks are in the Northeast, and um, specifically from two groups. And in fact, if I narrow it down from one specific group, that is the Jamaat al ahl al-Sina al al jihad otherwise called Boko Haram. Now, there, there are a few members of the other group, which is the Islamic State in West Africa province, that have also surrendered. Now, um, having said that, uh, why are they surrendering? Are they surrendering because they have recanted on the ideology in the first place that led them to become terrorists? The answer is likely no. Um, the reasons that we're hearing that is making them surrender are reasons around difficulty in their camps, then the fact that their commander has been killed, and um, the fact that the group that led to the death of their commander, which is the Islamic State in West Africa province, is giving them the option to either join in their fold or to go back to the Nigerian military. And it's all propaganda. They will usually add that if you go back to the Nigerian military, the military is going to kill you. So those are the reasons. Um, and that brings us to the more important point. If they haven't dropped their ideology, well, does that mean that if they come back into the society, they will continue propagating that ideology or even become uh, informants or um, suppliers, as it were, or for the, the, the main group that they, they belong to, which is the Jamaat al-Alisin al dawati al jihad Now, the good news, and I must um, at this stage commend the governor of Borno State. He is consist consistently sh showing himself as an exemplary leader. What he did is when he realized this situation, he uh, felt that this situation needs more than what the state government can handle. So he reached out to Mr. President and incidentally, just yesterday, also organized um, a, an elders meeting, a stakeholders meeting, where the state as a whole sat down, reviewed the situation and came out with certain recommendations. Now, whether the federal government is going to accept those recommendations or not, or one is a bit unsure, but just as an example to mention to you what the recommendations are, they talked about profiling of these um, members of um, the, the, especially the Jamaat al al and al dawat al jihad um, And then, of course, they talked about um, building a center, that's the Operation Safe Corridor Center in Borno State, where these uh, repentant Boko Haram will be put through. They also talked about the fact that even if they are put through this process, how are they going to be rehabilitated? And then in this, in, in, for this particular reason, encourage the federal government to assist the Borno State government in terms of rehabilitation. So what am I trying to drive at? The issue is not as simple as just um, looking at 
the fact that these are repentant members of Boko Haram. It has to go through a process. Now, the federal government does have a process, but then even then, um, how do we go about in terms of implementing this, this process? This process was meant for repentant um, members of the group. It wasn't meant for commanders who have blood on their hands. And now yeah. that is where we need to disaggregate the issues. If there are commanders among them that have blood on their hands, what are we going to do with those commanders? Are we going to say, okay, forgive them too, and then put them through the process of Operation Safe Corridor? Um, perhaps in the course of the conversation, I will talk about this other All right. component. I will stop here. Okay, um, we're, we're going to come back to you. Um, Maxwell Akbar, let let's bring you in again. You know, and I think this is also one of the angles that is important in this conversation. Um, who really should be given forgiveness uh, to people who have caused loss of lives in, in tens of thousands. There are currently people in IDP camps scattered across northern Nigeria and even, you know, as, you know down here, down, well, down in Edo State. Um, should state governors be able to give, you know, offer forgiveness to these terrorists on behalf of the people who have been the victims of their atrocities? That is what we are talking about. I don't know the I don't see the reason why everybody should be talking about the, the person who committed the crime. Nobody should be talking about the victim of the offense, the crime. They should have been first of all, get those people for their wife. The people that have suffered the these people have lost their husband, they have lost their wife, they have lost their father, they have lost their mother, they have lost their children. I don't and they're in the camp. Then the criminal that that was not even see any sign of repentance in him. You are not thinking of how to make him to be happy, how to make him to be relaxed, uh, to, 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 to relax. Then nobody is talking about the people in the IDD camp. Is it not funny? Are you not encouraging people to go, to go and commit crime? You are encouraging people to go and commit crime. After committing crime, you will now come back. They will still enjoy their, the, the, the process of their crime. They will still will go free in the, in the, in the name of uh, amnesty. Someone that has not even repented. So I don't know how to place this thing. I don't know how to arrange, how to address this issue. It's confusing. Amnesty is not that they are using amnesty. Go and check what is amnesty. I've discussed it in several fora. Amnesty is you don't misuse amnesty. Amnesty has to do with it. somebody who committed a crime against a state, and the the, thing, the, the, the crime has to do with the political. It's political on that too. No, Boko Haram bandits. What are you fighting? What is that that you are fighting? We, um, what do you call it? I was able to exercise that uh, amnesty, amnesty for the men, the Niger Delta militants, because they have something they are fighting, and he was able to address that issue. And they are giving amnesty. These people now, what is what are they fighting for? What are they asking for? These are the people that they killed, that they named, they do everything in the name of uh, money. And you said that they are giving them amnesty. And they have subjected a lot of people, they have sent the people to their, to their early graves. And they are giving them amnesty. So I don't know that they are dealing with it. I don't know how to place it. As far as I'm concerned, they are joking. Uh, they are Adam, joking. They are not serious. Yeah. Kabir Adam, I want you to also respond to that. Is it fair for the Borno State government or for the Nigerian government to give amnesty or to grant forgiveness uh, to those people who have committed these atrocities for the last decade in Nigeria? Um, is it fair that the government gives amnesty to these people on behalf of the victims so it's, it's a very complicated situation, and frankly, I wouldn't use the word fear um, because there are so many components to the situation. Um, again, we cannot isolate the uh, move. Uh, I, I don't even know what to call it at this stage. Um, we cannot isolate it from the general counterterrorism operation. Um, if you give me a bit, little bit of time, I'll give you background to where we are, why we're where we are at the moment. In 2014, the then uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, if I remember well, yeah, Minister of Foreign Affairs, um, Dr. Ongozi Okonjo-Wela, who is now the DGWTO, took a document called um, Countering uh, Violent Extremism to the United Nations um, uh, General Assembly meeting, which normally holds in every September. And this document contained four key components of Nigeria's counter-terrorism strategy. One of the components, which is why I'm, I'm bringing it up, has to do with the radicalization and counter-radicalization. Now, how was Nigeria going to achieve this radicalization and counter-radicalization? It was through this Operation Safe Corridor. And the UN endorsed that document. Um, not, not just the UN, several multilateral partners, including the EU and other development organizations that 
that are present in Nigeria. And as far as I know, they donated to that effort. And that was how Operation Safe Corridor was eventually implemented in 2015 under um, the current ad administration. Now, um, let's lead, lead up to 2021. As far as I know, there is um, a, an institute in Gombe State that puts these persons, uh, re le le let's be very careful in the use of words, they are supposed to be low-level members of the group that have repented, not commanders. They, they put them through 16 weeks of intensive de-radicalization effort and counter-radicalization effort that about 18 different experts, including skill acquisition, vocation, training, name them. Uh, and at the end of this 16-week period, a psychologist will evaluate the process to determine whether the, the radicalization process was um, successful or not, after which the person would be relieved and then he or she would be rehabilitated. Now, I have had this privilege of evaluating some of the components of this entire process. From the time the person comes out from wherever he is and declares himself as a repentant terrorist, the process starts from profiling him through the document, the documentation, uh, during which several questions will be asked, and then he will now be transported if he is accepted as someone that can be put into the program. Of course, there are others that will not be accepted, and they will be subjected to the normal um, chains of our, you know, laws, uh, as your, perhaps under the Terrorism Prevention Act or whatever it is that they've been found guilty of. Now, the challenge has been over time, and I'm sure my co-discussant, who is a lawyer, will understand that conviction is always a huge problem in Nigeria. So you are faced with one of two things. If, um, if someone is arrested, either you put him through the operation safe corridor or you subject, subject him through the court processes for conviction. I am not sure, and perhaps uh, my lawyer, my lawyer could, could discuss and would, would clarify this, how many of them have been convicted under the Terrorism Prevention Act as uh, amended 2013. I am, I, am, I am not aware that one person... But, but, but so isn't, it, isn't, it, isn't it a failure of the Nigerian government to have the Terrorism you know, Act and still not be able to use it um, at a time like this? One of the reasons why we have insecurity in Nigeria is the in ineffective and inefficient criminal justice system. I, we, I don't even need to go far. Currently, we're dealing with a situation in politics where you are seeing courts of competent jurisdiction of, of the same ruling on issues that have created a situation that as, as a, a non-legal person I'm embarrassed that were happening. So it's the same situation that you're having in, in, in other parts of, of um, law enforcement. In this instance, it's terrorism. And I can tell you the last time I checked, there are almost about 5,000 persons that have been arrested and that are awaiting trial under that act. So we, one of two things, either you put them through the operation safe corridor or you, 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 you now lock them up and you, while they are waiting for, for trial. Now, I, my honest opinion is either we improve on our legal systems so that we're able to prosecute them or we do the other one. And then the other challenge is that even under the um, TPA, the, the Terrorism Prevention Act, there is no death penalty. I think the highest um, uh, sentence in that law, if I remember well, is around 15 years. So what happens after 15 years? That person has been prosecuted, he's been sentenced. At the end of the day, he will be released. And when he's released, where is he going back to? He's going back into the society. Well, we 15 years should be enough time for proper rehabilitation and for re de-radicalization, I believe, if the government truly has... Because I remember they changed the name from... Uh, uh, changed the name to Nigerian Correctional, Correctional Center or something like that. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you know, Shouldn't that be enough time to correct? Criminal, the entire criminal justice system has issues. So the correctional services have their own issues. I can bet you at the end of 15 years, what you have is a more hardened criminal and terrorist than not a rehabilitated terrorist. And this is a fact, uh, unfortunately. Right. Okay. Um, my, uh, Maxwell Okpara, I'm coming back to you now uh, to share your thoughts on uh, the, uh, what do you think, you know, is the possibility of actually de-radicalizing, um, you know, some of all these persons. And do you also think that the government should be able to take a firmer stance against terrorism to prevent anybody who wants to consider joining a terror group in the future? The thing there is that the, the, you want to treat a terrorist as a terrorist. 
That's just in, in, you can witness what happened. Uh, and the color is a um, is, uh, 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 agitating for uh, self determination using his organization called IPUD. This government quickly went to court, declared them terrorist organization. And as if that one is not enough, now the Carlos house was attacked. He ran away. Now, this government now did everything humanly possible to uh, bring him back to, uh, and brought him back, back uh, to this country to come and take his trial. Now, if they can spend this kind of money, what is stopping them from getting all these uh, terrorists, uh, um, uh, uh, these people that are committing this uh, uh, terrorism uh, act in this country? I'm talking about the headsmen, the banditry, and the uh, Boko Haram. What stops you from even uh, um, um, declaring uh, them a terrorist organization and they treat them as such? So you cannot see that they are politicizing everything. What are that of uh, Igbo? They targeted Igbo at uh, what do you call it, the Republic, and make sure that they intercepted him there. I want to bring it back here. So the people that are committing the, the, the next crime, nobody's punishing them. And they are saying that you are fighting them, that they have repented, as if you don't know where they are. Uh, Shekumi has been visiting them. You know them. Some of them have even chased some communities out of their uh, ancestral home and take over their land. And they are living there to tomorrow. You said that you don't know them. What are we talking about? So, for me, they are not ready to, to fight terrorism. If they are ready to fight terrorism, they will fight terrorism and everybody will see it. So, I don't know the suggestion uh, while you wanted to give them the how to, you have the DSSS with you, you have the police with you, you have the army with you, you have the civil defense with you, you have all the whole security, you have the, all the whole ammunition, you have everything, you have the uh, copter, you are, you are, you are, you are, you, what is the intelligence gathering? So, I don't know the suggestion you people want us to give. As far as I'm concerned, they are not ready to fight terrorism. If you give the president of this country under 24 hours, all these things will get, I will bring them, I will, I bring everything to normal. It's a very simple thing. Because oh. people that are committing the crime, everybody knows them. They are moving around. Even yeah. in, in Sokoto self, I think in Sokoto, because they say that they are going to use the AK-47 and come to market to buy something. People are seeing them. What are we talking about? All right. Hold they, on. The Mr. people that you arrested, and I learned that most of them that you arrested, is all this video I that even, uh, and the hunters that even assisted in arresting them. And after arresting them, I hand over to, 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 to you. It's of you to treat them, use them as an example, to say that you are giving them amnesty. What kind All right. of a uh, jambo is All right, hold that? on, uh, Mr. Akpara. Uh, let's bring back uh, Kaviri Adamu. Um, Mr. Adamu, I, 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 of course, I'm sure you would understand uh, Mr. Akpara's concerns. Um, but I want you to share your thoughts. It might be my, my final question to you this evening. I want you to share your thoughts on how you feel. It might, it might be really, really difficult. How you feel the Borno State Governor will be able to speak with people who are currently living in IDP camps who have been there for years and tell them that, you know, there is something called Operation Safe Corridor and they would like to, you know, forgive these people who committed these crimes, you know, against them. Um, how do you think the Borno State Governor will be able to do that? And do you think he, he might also be um, a little insensitive or they might see him as, you know, a little insensitive, you know, bringing that offer uh, to p persons currently living in IDP camps. And also, final question to you still, as a security expert, do you think Nigeria has been sincere in its fight against insurgency? Okay, um, first off, uh, I think it depends on what part of uh, Borno State the governor um, decides to make th that speech. I'm aware that, um, just like I told you, the elders, Borno Elders Forum, the stakeholders met today, and um, their recommendation was that uh, this, this person should be profiled and put through whatever the radicalization processes the government has in place before releasing them. So he already has a platform uh, to, you know, ride upon, because these are the elders of Borno State, and they have, in clear terms, uh, endorsed uh, the so-called repentance, even though they've also cautioned, just like several elders from the Northeast, you recall the Senate president also cautioned that despite the fact that it's a welcome development, the processes have to be um, conducted in a manner that uh, the surrendering does not put, uh, potent further danger for the people. Now, with regards to the moral qu question that you have put forward, 
which is the person, the IDP. I think um, people keep on forgetting this. The Buhari administration um, created a new ministry called the Ministry of um, uh, uh, Humanitarian Affairs and Disaster Management. And currently, it is called the Super Ministry because it has probably the biggest portfolio of all the other ministries in the country. In the past, it used to be works and housing, but now it's, it's that ministry. It subsumes about four different sets of components. What is its primary responsibility to rehabilitate displaced persons? Now, I don't want to go into the discussions on whether that ministry is meeting its objectives or not. It's, me it's meant for those that are monitoring and evaluation to do that. Um, however, as far as government um, policy is concerned, I think this is um, a good development. And it is left for the state governors, for instance, to now approach the presidency, especially in this instance, where the governor is of the same party like the president, to ask critical questions about the functions of um, that particular ministry. Then let's not forget that under that ministry is the Northeast Development Commission which has specific responsibility for rehabilitation of um, not just those that are affected by the insurgency. So when I hear people of um, you know, um, ex, 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 uh, extreme knowledge that I expect to know this, um, speak around this moral question, I, I feel a bit uh, you know, sad that these are discussions that I would expect to hear you know, in a bare parlor of a pedestrian nature where people make such comparison that, well, um, you are pampering the terrorists and not, not, not the other, other way around. Uh, there may be gaps, I, I agree, uh, with regards to the functions of the ministry, but what is more important is that when we're given this type of impression, we should lay it down. For a government that has created such a ministry and funded the ministry, I think it's done a lot. I agree with you that, um, and this, this brings me to the second part of your question, we need to do more to address the security challenges within the country. My consultancy keeps a database the first quarter of this year, we're about to do the second quarter. In the first quarter of this year, 3,400 plus persons were killed in Nigeria. In one month alone, which is the month of June, 1,032 Nigerians were killed. And that is not acceptable. If we go by that figure, it means that at the end of 2021, about 12,000 people are likely to be killed in Nigeria. That is not acceptable. So we need to do more to reduce or even address these insecurity challenges. And it's not a responsibility that we can uh, uh, joke with. It's a responsibility that both the federal and state governments would need to come together to address the root causes of um, insecurity in the country. It's shocking how, you know, even some natural disasters, you don't hear of such figures. Um, you know, but yeah. we're, we're, we're looking at what, 10, 12,000, you know, lives in one year, um, you know, looking at the way things are going. And that's really why I asked the question about, yes, you know, you might have said that we need to do more. And also, I, you know, I, I like that you've also put out the um, uh, committee, you know, on disaster management and uh, humanitarian affairs. You've also put out, you know, the investments in, in those IDP camps. But no, I don't think anybody woke up in the morning and thought, oh, I'd rather live in an IDP camp. Um, this is still a sh you know, um, expression of the shortfalls of government that has put people in those positions. So no matter how much money is invested, no matter you know, if that ministry is made to look you know, as, as interesting as it is, properly funded, all of that, yes, it's necessary that the government does that. But that's still not a normal situation um, um, in any way. Um, and so, um, well, I just wanted to point that out. Um, and also quickly mentioned the fact that, you know, it, it, it's, it, there's so much, so much that we've spoken about over time. I've spoken with you multiple times um, with regards to the efforts towards making Nigeria safer. Our borders, arms proliferation, the sponsors of these terrorist groups. There's so many angles that the Nigerian government doesn't seem to have taken, you know, as seriously as, as, as it should. But um, it's... A continued conversation, and we hope that we'll continue to have these talks, and uh, hopefully we'll have a, a, a brighter picture, you know, in the next uh, year or so. Thank you very much, Kabir Adam. We'll really enjoy uh, talking with you. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. All right, thanks for staying with us. We'll take a short break, and when we return, we're moving our conversation to Edo State, where there is a crisis with the lawmakers. There are currently just 10 lawmakers in the Edo State National Assembly, when there should be 24 We'll talk about that after the short break. Stay with us.